Hi, everybody. My name is Anika Komoto, and I work at California Counseling Clinics in Santa Barbara. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. You now we have people from a variety of places here. So today's clinical education session's topic is social anxiety treatment via telehealth. Um, and I'm just kind of want to get the reading of the room of how many of the people here are currently using that modality to see people with social anxiety. So how many experts am I already talking to essentially? Um, you could just say, because I don't see all of you. So don't just raise your hand, say something, please. I'm using telehealth. Yeah, um, this is Laura Johnson and I do all my therapy through telehealth. And I started that at least five years ago, even before COVID. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Anyone else willing to share? I see there's uh, some folks popping into the chat too. Victoria says she's using telehealth as well. Okay. Is there anybody who hasn't used telehealth to see people with social anxiety and um, who otherwise work with people with social anxiety, but just don't do it via telehealth? Okay, so I see that most of you are doing it via telehealth or yeah, at least for the large part or some of you exclusively. So I'm just curious, like what have been your experiences with doing it through that modality? Any positives or negatives, anything that pops to your head as you're thinking about using that? Um, this is Laura and one of my issues has been with social anxiety is a little bit more trouble working with them to get them motivated to do the exposures via the hierarchy where in the past when I was there and I could do a little bit more in person with them, I think it was a little easier. However, I have ideas to overcome that, but it would be good to hear your ideas today. Mm -hmm. All right. And why do you, Laura, why do you think that is that it's kind of a little harder to motivate them through telehealth? Uh, because before I could actually do an exposure with them together in person, now it, you know, getting out of the office, obviously I could, and this is a little harder, is um, have them move their camera with them. But for social anxiety, it's slightly harder when I'm doing OCD and I'm having them touch something. It's a little easier. Like the other day I was having somebody who was worried about his doorknob. Well, I can have him position the camera and have him touch his doorknob. Obviously, with social anxiety, moving out of the house, carrying a camera is pretty hard. Before, I, you know, I had stores near me. I could just walk to a store or there was another therapist in the office. I could just, you know, get started with them and then they could do the rest because they'd already have an idea of what it's like. So I would say that's the main barrier. But the rest is similar and it's okay. I haven't really had people stop therapy because of this, but then I might have to modify my approach a bit and um, figure out more. It's a little harder for motivation sometimes. Um, with other things, it's not as hard, but this one can be because of the difficulty in moving with them or going right. with them. Yeah. Right. So you can't do the initial ones with them at least. Okay. Any yeah. other experiences? How is it? Um, how is it different, better, worse than real life? Real life, okay, it's real life too, but okay, face to face. I do groups uh, as well as individual, and certainly in groups, it's severely limiting in terms of the exercises. I'm well aware that there are exercises you can do online, but it's simply not this and it does trigger their anxiety and so they are useful um, but it's simply not the same as having people get up and mingle um, it's just not the same um, and even one-on-one -on -one, uh, in addition to what Laura said in terms of doing in vivo exposures with strangers out of the office 
doing role play exposure. It's not really role play, but in session exposures right in the office with just you. Again, you can do that in Zoom, but it is limiting. And so ever since the vaccination, whenever uh, I, I encourage people to come in if they're fully vaccinated. And, uh, and so most of them, uh, my clients do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're right. Like there's a there's a certain limit that the telehealth puts on us regarding to what we can do. Like either starting up exposures with them, like Laura mentioned, or like you were saying, even just the fact that they're in the room and talking to each other, which is another level of exposure. That's kind of like either limited or missing, depending on what we're using. So, um, I put just some pros and cons down here. Um, and I think like none of us will really question the pros of that <laughs> regarding the access to therapists and convenience. And um, it's just, there's a little less barriers for people to attend telehealth session overall. Um, there's one in specific that I wanted to point out is that if we take account into who are usually coming to therapy or who's the large population who's coming to social anxiety treatment or young adults and adolescents, and for them, the modality is actually very comfortable. I remember when I was still in my bachelor's program, which was a very long time ago when inter internet was still a new thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, I did uh, I did a study where I was looking at how uh, how comfortable people are with communicating and how much do they have fear of um, fear of failure or how well they. Hmm, What's their self-esteem? And these people who preferred online communication like chat rooms and internet, actually their fear of failure was lower there and their self-esteem was higher there than in real life communications. So that just means that it's just one less barrier than a person who prefers that modality will have to overcome, which is kind of benefit if you think about it, right? Because many of them <laughs> are very scared stiff to think about that they have to come to therapy or talk to a therapist. So it does match the communica communication modality of that most common age group that we see. And um, there are some additional perks. For example, with Zoom, think about it. We are looking at our faces as we speak, we speak which is not usually the case, you know, <laughs> when we are in real life situations, then we don't have that um, feedback or that camera coming in. We could, but often that's not the case. So it's another layer of exposure. I think sometimes it might make things a little more difficult, but it's it's also an added perk of um, video platforms. And um, technically for groups, it does allow the breakout rooms and private um, private conversations, even though I think it's more hassle sometimes than it's worth it with people getting confused and not knowing what to do and where to go and and how to handle that, mm -hmm. yeah. And the uh, cons of virtual treatment, again, the lack of that multi-sensory experience that Larry described and the reduced information for us because we can't keep track of everybody's faces and body language as well on the screens. Um, people might turn their screen off um, and there could be that reduced uh, options for exposure. Um, I wrote, but possibly, but not necessarily, because it really depends on the person and what their goals are. Potential technical difficulties, right? Uh, your session can be cut off, and what do we do with them? Uh, or their session can be cut off. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at least in telehealth settings, when we're talking about groups, I feel like it really limits the group size. Um, I think eight is about the maximum that I could ever see in virtual settings, probably even less, like five to six um, seems better. Maybe seven, eight starts to go a little higher there um, just to keep track of. And there's a lot of other telehealth concerns that are not so spe specific to social anxiety. Um, but yeah, there's. I just wanted to quickly go over some research um, about virtual and electronic therapy options for social anxiety. There isn't that much, surprisingly, given how common it is, there isn't that much. Um, in the previous years, like 2010 to 2020, there was a lot of research about virtual reality. I don't know if any of you have, are thinking or are familiar with like 
platforms such as Second Life or where you could choose your avatar and then you could like choose your character and be who you are. And like, it had a lot of fun stuff. Like it, it showed that basically the social anxiety does translate to those virtual environments. So it, we can't be just anxious at home and then confident in Second Life or something like that. So um, those, um, those behaviors will translate to those environments. And conversely, we can also use those environments to, um, to, de uh, to improve and treat social anxiety. So there was another study that was showing that, for example, um, there were neural correlates in how the people were seeing themselves and like how that positive self-referential processing was increasing after the, after the therapy interventions. And there have been some studies, um, some very few, but some controlled trials too, um, and showing essentially that virtual reality or extended reality interventions were pretty good in terms of being able to reduce the symptoms. Um, so they were kind of like precursors for telehealth, I want to say. Mm. Post-pandemic research, it's very lacking anything, really. I was hoping that there would be at least a few random <laughs> um, randomized control trials, but no, there's like the only ones that are there are either about ICBT or so, sort of like more like self-learning options, which is not help, um, very helpful for us. And um, there there's been like preliminary studies, but I don't know that these give more than we already know by doing it by ourselves. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> We're already doing it so we can see how much it works or not. So there hasn't been any, any um, strong studies showing that there's actually proof or how much is there a difference between whether it's being seen in person or not. And that is true for the groups and that's true for individual. And there's a few studies just discussing the different benefits and the different challenges of um, treating social anxiety either via telehealth, uh, via telehealth when compared to in person. Um, most of it is pretty um, self-evident, I want to say. Not much that's groundbreaking or would add to what you would learn if you're doing it by yourself. Um, I don't know. This is just a list of what our learning has been at California Counseling Clinics, and obviously you're welcome to add to it, but these are the interventions that lend themselves well to virtual settings. And I'm wondering if you're looking at the list here, if there's something that you don't see here and has worked well for you. And some, some of the things that we're using is psychoeducation, using the therapeutic relationship as a basis for the work. For example, using essentially your relationship with the client or patient as an exposure in itself. Um, in group settings, fostering group members' connections to each other, teaching the social cement strategies, like sharing, asking questions, giving compliments, whatever that is. Uh, fostering, asking questions, giving or receiving feedback, doing some fact checking there, checking assumptions teaching, modeling, and practicing social skills, including assertiveness skills. Um, what would you do in that situation? Um, how could you handle that? What could you say? What would you want to say? What are you too afraid to say? Um, the moment we say role play, then again, most people are very scared, but <laughs> we can do it in an informal way of um, that it still places them in a situation where they have to imagine that uh, interaction and the response. Um, teaching and practicing mindfulness and grounding skills. I always like the past, present, future metaphor where when we're talking about the past and we feel depressed and we ruminate on all the things that went wrong, then we're being stuck in a period that, that has already passed or you've been worried about the future and what will happen and how those, all those horrible consequences will happen if we do X, Y, Z, then we're still away from the present moment we're in the future so how can we bring ourselves back to in the here and now um, because most people that i've encountered they're not that enthusiastic about meditation or mindfulness or anything of such they think that it's kind of this voodoo voodoo thing that doesn't have any real benefits so um kind of like reframing that understanding of what mindfulness is and 
It's just basically being grounded in the present moment and in reality rather than ruminating about the past or worrying about the future. Um, teaching the stress tolerance skills, I lend, lend a lot of material from Marshall Linehan and DBT there, um, how to be present for really getting really dysregulated. Troubleshooting of challenging situations, like what can you do if you're going to a family party or work functions, having like little simple plans of what to do. Um, cognitive restructuring, reframing strategies, nothing new there. Modeling validation, normalization, behavioral experiments, and encouraging people to come up with individualized exposures that are relevant for them. So um, for example, um, Sometimes in the group, we'll, we'll make it a group challenge. So if somebody is really worried about embarrassing themselves and we had, for example, for one week, we had a challenge of buying adult diapers from CVS. So it was somebody that somebody came up with it and the whole group tried to do it. So it was kind of like shared exposure, if you will. It was a lot of fun for some and it was horrible for others. <laughs> but anyway, everybody, everybody got to do it in the end of the day. Um, or it can be also something that's relevant for that person. For example, in our social anxiety, virtual social anxiety group, one person who was about to graduate, they also wanted to do a public speaking challenge before they left the group. And not everybody wanted to do that. So it was particular to them, but the group was more open to that. And they practiced their own exposures by giving feedback and pointing out things that she could have maybe done differently or better or did well. Because if you think about it, then the evaluation holds a lot of power. So people who have social anxiety, they're not so likely to put themselves in a situation where they have to evaluate others. And if they do, they just say usually positive things, if anything. Okay, and shaping and reinforcement. That's also something that you can do in whichever settings. Um, I'm wondering if there's something in that list that you were doing in your practice over the telehealth that, um, that you don't see and that works well for you. Um, I could add something. Uh, so it may actually be something that is included in your list here, but um, I worked with a client who social anxiety was pretty much focused to uh, doing um, professional public speaking events. And um, I uh, put out a request to um, our um, NSAC clinicians if they'd be willing to engage in a um, in a, an exposure with this client and I had um, I think about five or so therapists that agreed to um, to just you know uh, be the part the audience for this client's presentation it was a short presentation about 10 minutes or so um, and it worked really well it, it it felt like it advanced his um, therapy uh, significantly, and um, we we came back to it several times after that session. And um, so uh, I took a little bit of uh, work on my end to uh, facilitate it, but it it definitely was a positive experience. Can you imagine? You could never do it in real life unless you just use the clinician from clinicians from your own office or something like that. But it would be virtually impossible. And uh, now we can do it, which is another point for for telehealth. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Any other examples that you can think of that maybe they are in that list, but maybe something that has worked well for you. Um, I could add one other thing, uh, if I may. Um, I got approached a couple of months ago by uh, a founder of a startup who was um, developing a platform for participants to come and um, uh, participate in a mock dating session. Um, and uh, they were they were on the in the video call um, with an avatar 
um, and, and as was the other person. And then afterwards, there were some uh, professional dating coaches and a communication specialist who reviewed the, um, the video and gave some pretty um, detailed uh, feedback um, on, you know, when you, when you said this, perhaps you could have also added um, a more open-ended question, or maybe this was an opportunity for you to, to provide more information about yourself. It, it wasn't necessarily a traditional sort of CBT exposure in that we tend to, you know, shy away from teaching social skills, but in and of itself, it was an exposure because there was a, a, a good amount of anxiety that the client had going into it. And actually the information that was presented afterwards, I was able to get a copy of that feedback was quite useful um, and helpful, helpful ideas for, you know, uh, that person to engage in other, you know, in, in the next kind of real life dating experiences. If anybody's interested, I could pass on the name of the, the platform that um, they were doing it. Uh, they were in the beta testing, so it was free to the client. Very cool. Yeah, please do pass it on. I think I have many people who would be interested <laughs> with the dating part. Okay, um, so let's proceed here. Um, so overall, what we do inside the face-to-face -face session, it mostly will work in the telehealth as well. There could be some of the issues there. I'm wondering if we can take a moment to discuss Laura's question, which was how can we work around the motivation part where it seems like it's a real struggle sometimes to begin it up if you can't like take them in your arm and just go to the next grocery store. So um, how have you dealt with it if you've seen like difficulty starting off? Like what are some of the strategies that people in this group have used for that? Well, whether in telehealth or in person, in addition to taking people out to do experiments, you can do you know, in vivo, uh, which of course it was next to impossible telehealth. I suppose it's possible, but I can't imagine. <clears throat> you uh, can do experiments in imagery, uh, and you could also do, in some cases, do experiments in role play fashion. The client isn't role playing; they're being themselves. But you, and if you have other therapists in your office, um, they are. Uh, playing the stranger as a way to practice I mean, usually it's an anxiety trigger and of course you can video record it uh and play it back which becomes its own experiment and the other you know getting feedback from the video evidence as to how they actually came across versus how they anticipated or imagined they came across and of course the other advantage of video recording it is that it it sounds cruel, but it makes them anxious. So it makes it a more useful experiment, um, exposure to do. So those are ways in addition to the in vivo that can be done on telehealth or in person. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Larry, um, more useful notions. Yeah, well, I've used also a lot of um, using other therapists or externs or interns in weaving them into the session. Of course, it's not the same as them going and talking to somebody who's really true stranger in a grocery store, but still better than nothing. It gets them started to at least talking to strangers or talking to other people. I think one thing that um, if I see that things are not proceeding and the motivation is low, um, I try to be as specific as possible. Literally, like you're going to Starbucks at 10 30 in the morning. You're if there are two people behind the counter, you're going to talk to the right hand side person you are gonna give a compliment and tell them something about their hair color or their that level of detail and uh, really like trying to figure figure out what would they be comfortable with, what would be the minimum program. Maybe it is asking for the time, maybe it's asking what's the favorite drink on the barista's menu, but being specific as that and then practicing it in session. Okay, so if you're 
if you're going to that right-hand side, Barista, so what could you tell them? Well, I could tell them that. Okay, so why don't you tell it as if I was here, you know? So really practicing it through, but re really making it very specific when in which location and how they're going to do it, because it just increases the chances that they'll actually follow through. Usually if they don't do stuff, it just means that we're aiming too high. And I think like, um, yeah, the session exposure with you is one good way of working through stuff and practicing stuff. Um, but it's it's true. I think it's harder and we are limited and we, if we can't go and out and do the things that we're doing. I wonder any other ways that people have overcome that lack of motivation. Okay, I don't hear anybody, so I'll add one more thing. Like, I sometimes put in the accountability <laughs> counter. I'm like, okay, so why don't you go do that in the next coming two hours, and then you're going to send me an email after you finish that. So that puts the urgency on them, and usually if they get to postpone it, they will postpone it, and they'll postpone it till the next week, till the one day before the session, and they probably have some some reason why they couldn't do that. So putting the urgency there and putting it very close. Usually I ask them to do either same day or if they have a exposure plan, then checking in via emails every day. So there's that accountability and less, less chance of putting it off so it becomes bigger and more anxiety provoking. Uh, Laura, did that answer your question or is there still any something that was kind of like open up in the air? It, it gives me an idea of some possibilities. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. So let's see. Let's, how do I get to the next page? Oh, here. Okay. So I'm moving on to different levels of psychological intervention. And what I mean by that is that either in person or in group, we can talk about different things in therapy. The first intra psychological or individual level is often like, we're literally asking them questions about their experience, their thoughts, their feelings, something that they went through. And it's great. I mean, obviously it helps us to understand their life experience. Um, the second level, interactional, interpersonal, it's more when we're bringing it either in the room between us or if, it, if there's a group around them, bringing them in relation to other people in the group. So that is more like, what was it like for you to give me this feedback or... Do you experience any difficulties connecting to others in the group? Or how did you just relate to what XYZ just shared about the fear of rejection? So I think it's really, really important because it allows them to actually connect to each other and start to form the connections, which they're not that great of doing outside that therapy office. Um, and then the last level, it's group or diet as a system. So we're not asking so much about how to how did you relate to this and so and so or what do you think of me but we're looking us as a system or the group as a system so for example if if it's an individual therapy we would ask questions such as so like how, what do you think of us working together this far how are we doing as a team like how have things been going what are some of the things that you think we're good at together so it's not you and i it's us together and uh, if it's a group, it could be like, for example, what are some of the strengths that you see when you look at this group or how do you feel about coming to this group? And if we're looking at group, then we definitely wanna do most of the work on the interactional and group level, because otherwise it just becomes like serial individual therapy where we're talking to people and doing individual therapy with them in the group, which is, I mean, I guess still interesting, but it doesn't, um, maybe not as effective. But individual therapy too, I think it's really important not to ignore the levels two and three, especially in virtual settings, because um, if they come face to face and we see them and they see us, it gives a different connection and different read. And that read is missing. For example, in face-to-face -face sessions, if, if we're working on the second level, we're just leaning towards them and we're smiling and we're asking something and it, it works differently. 
And if in, if they're in virtual settings, they might not notice that or see those things. So those questions are really important about targeting um, those levels two and three because it's not obvious and it's not conveyed by nonverbal nonverbal means. So essentially, as we're working in the virtual settings, I want to say that those two, the upper two levels are more important, like, or according to my PowerPoint, the inter interactional and the group level are just a little more, we should put more effort into making sure that we operate on those levels as, well, as more, because it doesn't come naturally. Um, so moving on to the groups. So this is kind of the structure that we use for the first group for our weekly one hour social anxiety group. Um, we work with a lot of Santa Barbara University students. So um, we um, have a group currently that's um, 20, people in their twenties and thirties. Um, and um, Remember, Larry made a good point that it could last anywhere from 45 to 90 minutes. And like, usually I wouldn't go over the 90 minutes just because people get overwhelmed and they get tired, especially if they're online, they get tired and overwhelmed. I think most of us will want a break after an hour. But sometimes I noticed that I think the ideal length would be like hour and 10 minutes. If I could, could run it at that, that's where it usually keeps on going, but um, it's it's not very conducive to billing and <laughs> sticking to our our slots in your schedule. So so anyway, um, going through uh, some steps such as introduction, like introduction is just something to set the tone for the group, like get people to know each other a little bit because they're very anxious. Usually it's better if it's structured than whatever you say, people are gonna repeat. So if you're gonna talk about your dogs, they're gonna talk about their pets. So be purposeful in what you want the group to be about and what you wanna introduce about yourself and about the others. Um, group rules and agreement, like hopefully you will have already done a telehealth um, agreement with them. It's a version where you've you know, talked about things such as not doing sessions in public places or, um, not having mother and father sit on the couch of the room while you're doing your sessions, stuff like that. But it's still good to um, go over that plus uh, what will happen if they meet each other in, in person outside the therapy room. Let's say client B is with the husband and client C comes across. So how do they know each other? Because uh, husband might see that they say hello to each other and what do they say, how they met. So our go-to is usually that they met at the training, which is not entirely wrong. So this way they have something that they agree how they handle that if, if they see each other outside. It's not so very unlike from real life groups. Creating safety. Again, like because we don't have that physical um, comfort of being in the same room with other people and feeling each other near us. Um, just things like, what is it that you don't want to happen in this group? And people will go usually like, I don't want, I don't want to anybody to criticize or be like nasty to each other, or I don't want the phones to ring all the time, whatever that is. So it's just like it gives them an opportunity to talk about things they don't want to happen and they are fearful of. Sometimes also, mm, I like that exercise, but it depends on the group sometimes people sometimes it doesn't go really well and in some groups it goes imagine if it was the worst group ever um, an hour has passed you just spent the whole hour in this group and it was the worst group ever like tell me what went wrong and people will be like well everybody was talking over each other and nobody listened and they criticized each other and in the end of the session they you know um, nobody wanted to come back so this would be the worst session ever and then you can switch and go from there and go like, oh, but imagine it was the best session ever. Tell me what went right. And then, oh, everybody was friendly and allowed and took, took turns talking and like validated and listened and was curious and everybody connected to each other. That gives you an idea of what people are looking for and what is it that they're afraid of. And I usually pull for individual responsibility as well I ask questions like so tell me what did you do to make it the worst group ever and what did you do to make it the best group ever so people could say like well I was quiet and I didn't say anybody and I was super disappointed afterwards okay 
So it kind of like primes them a little bit of what they need to do from their part. So it can be also helpful. And um, also we introduced the idea of weekly commitment, what's gonna happen and how do we do that and kind of the homework or inter, inter session, between session exposure that we want them to do. Any questions here for the, for the structure for the first group? Okay, so this is like a sample structure for an ongoing groups when they already have the first one and they're going, going every week. So we usually start with check-ins and it can be short or it can be long. If we're doing a longer version of it, we really try to facilitate sharing and connecting by others. So if somebody says, well, I had a horrible week because I went to that girl in my class and I asked her out and she said, you, I don't wanna see you, right? So then instead of saying, oh, that must have been so hard for you. Like, we don't do that. We're like, okay. Who else has had experiences like that? And usually other people in the group can um, provide their experiences and their, uh, their shared lived um, experience in that spot. Like really with the group, I pull my participation and my validation and connection to minimum so that it can occur between the group members. Again, um, I think with telehealth, it is so, important, even more important than in face-to-face -face because um, otherwise if other people in the group are socially anxious and they're not speaking up much and it becomes a dialogue between me and the person who's speaking, then it doesn't do anything new for them other than being observed while sharing, um, which could be useful, I suppose. Um, so we ask questions like, what thoughts or feelings came up for you as you listened or who else has experienced a situation like that? And then we usually go forward with psychoeducational piece or skill teaching. So it can be something we could talk about selective negative attention, or we could practice saying no, or whatever that is that usually derives from what's being shared in a group. I feel like it's just lends better if it's, it is based on their check-ins. But we can't always do that. And sometimes we have a structure in mind and then we can just go with that. Usually if you have an own, um, if you have a structure in mind that you want to follow, let's say that you um, mm, decided that this week we are going to design an experiment that will um, look at consequences of interpersonal rejection, then it's smart to say it out in the beginning before the check-in. So they start to kind of mentally warm up to that and probably they will share a little different things in their check-ins than they otherwise would. Hmm. So, but it's otherwise you're gonna have your, your check-in round and then you're gonna go, oh, okay. And by the way, now we're gonna put this all aside and we're start on a completely new slate. And that, that creates a little bit difficulty in connecting to that sometimes. Um, yeah. And then um, application of learning. This is where we usually practice whatever we're doing. And it can be anything. It can be a discussion of how a certain concept applies to their life. I don't know, selective negative attention, for example. Or it can be a practice of assertiveness skills or role plays of difficult situations. It can be slowing down the speech and lowering the voice. It can be practicing disclosure. It can be practicing small talk or asking questions from each other. Practice making a choice. I already said that earlier, but there's um, making a choice or giving an evaluation is sometimes extremely hard for them. So it's like being able to do that in the group, even selecting somebody to ask a question, it's a huge thing. So, um, and that's something that does allow, lend itself easily to telehealth. <laughs> I just often put it out there and say, okay, you know what? Why don't you choose somebody to ask your question from? Oh, can I just ask everybody? No, you can't <laughs> pick somebody. And the next person will pick somebody else. And um, usually people are pretty social justice oriented. So they go around and make sure that nobody will get uh, ignored, but um, technically they could. So um, then, make sure that it like somebody doesn't get either completely um, left out 
or if they do, make space to talk about it. So you can say something like, I noticed that you stayed mostly quiet, those questions and answers, and I tended to ask that, like, what was it like for you? So they don't leave with a new trauma from the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also do um, practice receiving personal, asking, receiving, giving any sort of feedback, right? So we often have like um, sessions where we're like, okay, so what are some of the things that you're worried about yourself that people think of you? For example, um, somebody says, well, people always tell me that I'm very intimidating. And why don't you go ahead, let's ask this group, are you intimidating? And then we also make the deal that they do mm, cruelly tell the way they see it, because we say that's not helpful if you provide like a bent mirror or broken mirror, like that's not helpful for the person or for anybody really. So be honest, right? And for most part, if if it's prompted, I think people are honest. They, of course, they say something nice too, but they they are saying things like, you know what, like first session, you didn't talk very much. And when I shared, you didn't say much to that. So I thought you didn't like me very much. So people can say things like that. Um, and practice of social double. So what, essentially, how would people handle a situation like that? What have you done in the past? What would you do in that situation? That's that's also really helpful because they don't just come for a sense of connection. They also do come for practical support. So um, how would you do that? This is a great, great part here. And it's important how it's different from advice giving is that we'll say that it is we're gonna ask for how other people would deal with it. And it might or might not be what you wanna do. It might be very different for what's comfortable for you. But let's just open that behavioral repertoire a little bit and you can accept and you can reject or accept whatever works for you or pick from what you want from that. So really like um, trying to make sure that it's not, um, it's not um, order or it's not something that they will then need to go and do at home. It's more like, this is how others would do it, pick or not, whatever you want from that. And then usually we'll go from, from there, we'll go to the commitment for the coming week, actionable steps, realistic commitments. If they say, oh, I don't know, maybe like seven out of 10 likely to do it. Okay, what can we get it to make it to 10 or to nine at least? Because probably if they say seven, if they already today think they're not gonna do that, what do you think is going to happen in a few days? Not very much. Um, and the last thing, wrap up closure. Um, so in ideal, we want to spend about five to 10 minutes talking about how they're doing. To be honest, I think I've rarely had ever more than five minutes to that because the rest will suck up the time. So usually we ask questions like, okay, so what was it like for you to be in the group today? Or what are you taking with you? Or share one phrase or sentence that summarizes your experience in the group. And um, and they do, and it's usually like a nice way of closure, and it works for the telehealth. Um, that kind of short conclusion phase. Um, yeah. Um, so see, here are some of the issues that can come up. You know, connection comes cuts off. So usually when we do groups, we have two facilitators usually a, a clinician and an extern or intern. But if you don't, maybe you have agreed with one of the members of the group and maybe given some handouts or something that they can use to discuss while you're getting yourself back online. It's really inconvenient but if it happens, but sometimes it happens. And so that there's there's like a, at least plan of action while you're not there, what they're gonna, how they're gonna use the time and what they're gonna do to deal with it. Some, someone shares something triggering. I remember we had a group where um, one of the um, participants who was very socially anxious, but also very depressed, started to share about the self-harm. And then a bunch of other people who had that in the past also, you know, were calling me later after the group, but it, it, it's hard, like that stuff happens. I think as long as we make some space to talk about it and acknowledge that it can be difficult for people, then that's okay. But I think the worst case scenario is we're on telehealth, so we can't see the reactions. Nobody can stop on your door after they're out of the group, right? So make sure that there's some time to 
to stop and breathe with that before they leave the group and then leave open some option of contacting you if, uh, if the group is not enough to close that topic for them. Um, someone does not connect to the group. Sometimes it's underlying issues. There's maybe some autistic traits that are stronger. Sometimes it's cultural. Um, again, like as, as, as much as possible, whatever's happening in the group, we'll try to address in the group. So we'll try to gently bring it up and say, hey, like I've noticed you haven't spoken very much or that you haven't shared very much and how, how do you feel with that and how do others feel with that? So kind of make it a group issue. Try not ignoring it at the very least. Because <laughs> usually my experience is that if that is doesn't get addressed, then they will drop out of the group. So um, to prevent that, the one way we can do is, is talk about it and see if it helps. Um, misses the group often, kind of the same thing. Um, we, had a, we had a kind of agreement that they will come at least to first four sessions and then they have a choice whether they proceed or not. But if I see that they start to miss like every other group or every third group or something like that, we'll have a talk with them and see if it's it's really working for them. It's the best idea because it does cut down on the cohesiveness a little bit. It, I gotta say, if it's in person, I've noticed that somebody missing out on the group has a little bit of a bigger impact. If it's in the telehealth setting, I've noticed that it's not as severe. I think it's mainly damaging for themselves because they don't connect to others as much while others are going on developing connections and they are feeling a little left out. So it can kind of self-perpetuate the problem. But I, I've, I've seen like I've done groups for, I don't know, 15 years, more than that, 20 years. Um, in, in real life, if people are missing, like people really take it personally. And in telehealth, it's, it's not as much. It's more like it's lighter somehow, and I don't know why, why that is. If anybody has any ideas about that, I'd be interested to hear. Yeah. And advice giving. I think advice giving is a huge problem, <laughs> can be a huge problem if we have very some very talkative and um, people who have a lot of things to say and then you know, reeling it in and making sure that the, uh, any experiences that there's, first of all, if you're starting to give advice, then I always, the one way that I handle it is like, okay, looks like you want to give X, Y, Z, a lot of advice here. How could you not give advice, but just talk about your experiences? So if you want to share about your life, that's completely fine. But like, if you, um, maybe you could just share how it has played out in your life or what has been important for you, just to reduce that likelihood of them feeling patronized. I'm wondering if you see any other problematic situations that can come up in the group. I can jump in here. Um, you know, something that I've noticed in groups, especially with teens, is uh, that's different from when we do groups in person, um, is paying attention when other people are doing exposures. So if we're doing presentation exposures um, in person, you know, a lot of times the audience is paying attention, they're cued in, they're giving some sort of nonverbal feedback. And, uh, and it's, I found that that's a little bit harder to control and address in the virtual setting because it's so easy to click away and do something else when you're not actively the one participating or doing the exposure. That's a challenge that I've run into. And I've just tried to address it head on um, by letting folks know, you know, setting expectations, video camera is on, speaker is on, and we want you to give some feedback or ask a question after this presentation is over to try and increase that participation. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's there's a difference between adolescents and young adults. They're usually the older they get, the more motivated, less distracted. But it, yes, it definitely can be an issue. And also, like, it's sometimes it's functional. It's like, you know, it, they get a little relief by doing something else or turning the camera off. And um, yeah, talking about it's probably the best option there. Okay, the last slide um, that I have for you is the therapist pitfalls. So I put a bunch in there. Some of them are about, <laughs> some of them are about uh, uh, telehealth and some of them are not. <laughs> but um, 
For example, um, the first one, we may, may fail to see individual behavior as an indication of a system level problem, right? So a good example in individual therapy, it might be that the patient is not coming in and is canceling the sessions and we're thinking, oh, they're the bad person because they're not responsible, but maybe there's something else that is going on. Maybe we have different cultures. Maybe they don't trust us. Maybe there's something that's happening or in the group, maybe there's always somebody who's speaking up too much or not enough. And we might like just individualize it and think, okay, that's, that's something that they are doing and it has nothing to do with the rest of us. But usually there's some group dynamic that's leading up to that. So it might be interesting to explore it or to understand where it's coming from. What in the group or what in the system necessi necessitates that behavior that they're engaging in. So if it's like, Serial individual therapy that provides that pertains to groups. So if we're starting to do that individual therapy slash counseling, and the rest of the group is just there and kind of like watching it, um, or giving too much feedback as therapists, like constantly giving evaluations or saying, "Oh, you did well," or "How oh, don't you think this is so great what you did?" or like um, that kind of pat on the head kind of dog thing, don't do that. <laughs> we really wanna um, switch the evaluator role to themselves. So if they said something that's clearly like absolutely mind blowing, I mean, obviously you can use your nonverbal reactions to react to that, but maybe, wow, okay, how did you, how did you get that done? Or like really, really shifting that to them, how they think what they did and like, like, kind of like ways of reinforcing the adaptive behavior without like evaluating it. Like looks like using compliments really helped you to connect to coworkers, right? We're not saying, oh, look at you, you were so good. You were giving a compliment. Um, so we may forget to ask for feedback for ourselves because people with social anxiety often don't express it so much because they're worried because they, obviously they're fearful of the situation. So they don't necessarily tell us. And we assume because there's no, expression of dissatisfaction or we assume that everything is okay. So we have this kind of two kind of um, ruptures that can occur. One of them are um, open confrontation ruptures where people tell us that they're not happy with something. But then we have those withdrawal ruptures where we see a lot of cancellations and being late. And like, if that starts to happen, probably, probably some feedback asking would be in order what is going on there. Um, Sometimes we focus too much on problems and problem solving. So this, you know, there's got to be, they're already staring at the screen for an hour or even longer. Like it doesn't all have to be so painful. Like maybe having some playfulness and, and some just human humanity in that telehealth connection would be great. Uh, so in group situations, we often like just sometimes talk about hobbies or passions or what people are good at or secret superpower, whatever that is, and usually goes down really well. Um, sometimes we fail to recognize skills and strengths and use shaping. So we're like, okay, well, if you did, you had a plan to go to the coworker and you didn't do that. So, okay, let's see how we can make you not fail. And that's not what we want, right? We want to really shape them towards that. So anything that they, even if they think about an exposure, but they didn't do it, the fact that they didn't forget about it and they thought about it, it's something you wanna kind of recognize and say, oh, okay, well, at least you thought about it, right? So maybe next week we'll get to go into the door <laughs> or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And um, we may forget to ask for permission before feedback or advice is given. So we might give recommendations or, or feedback and we don't know if, if, if that's what they want. We take their agency away. We're like, okay, you should do this X, Y, Z. So can I offer something? Would you like to hear it? So in this case, we give the agency to them and they have a choice of whether they want to receive it or not. And I've, I've had people say, you know what? I do, but not right now. And that's okay too. And lastly, sometimes with telehealth, especially when we're trying to, especially in groups, if we're trying to handle like a bunch of people at the same time, we might have this happy-go-lucky atmosphere where nobody talks about things that are irritating or annoying to them. And like, 
they only give positive feedback and it's, it's again it's that broken mirror that doesn't really help anybody so just having that mental check-in with yourself if if, uh, if we're allowing space to talk about things that are not well, what are what is difficult in this group or what is difficult in this relationship? What isn't working? Like, how can we improve that? So just making space for that. All right, this is it for the PowerPoint. We have whole three minutes for questions. <laughs> I know I didn't think, think it through very well, but yes. Any reactions, any questions, any thoughts, anything at all? I thought that was really fantastic and helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, such a pleasure to have you speak with us today. Yes, round of applause. Um, and I, I guess I, uh, would, I have a question. I'm wondering whether, whether you or if anybody else has actually incorporated new exposures into the virtual environment that they weren't doing in person that they found helpful for social anxiety specifically. Um, to get back to sort of those, the advantages of using an online format, whether there are new things that we can work in. One thing that we have been using is using that people are in their own home. We've used like exposures of personal things, like, I don't know, we have people play an instrument or, or tell a story about the picture or something like that. But usually they don't come to therapy office with, they could if we're really mindful about that, but, um, that's one way. I'm wondering if others have any other thoughts on that. Speaking to large groups, what um, John was saying earlier, that definitely we've done that. The public speaking, it's, it's pretty awesome. That's great. And I love the idea of, of being able to use personal things in their environment. So I think that's a great point that we don't often have that opportunity and sharing, sharing personal or private things about ourselves, likes and dislikes, hobbies and interests, opinions, I think is usually a big exposure for folks, but can also be really uh, mood boosting. And I feel like can, can feel really rewarding too. That's great. All right, I'm realizing it's two o'clock. So I know everybody probably is running to the next thing, but thank you so much for this presentation. This was wonderful. And thank you to everybody for attending.